if you don't have an aneurysm in that moment, it's great news, but it doesn't mean you're absolved from having one because they're an acquired condition. If you have a um, predisposition in your family, if something in the DNA where the artery is a little more fragile or more prone to forming these ballooning or outbouching. It can be very difficult approaching a family member, or especially your baby sister who doesn't want to do anything. After seeing both Deborah's history and my history, she still is adamant it's okay. Welcome everybody um, to this webinar. We have to close out September, which is Brain Aneurysm Awareness Month. And what we're gonna talk about today is I have a family history of brain aneurysms and what does this mean for me? So we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Spiota of MUSC and a couple of his patients, twin sisters, Diane Harrell and Deborah Taylor. So Dr. Spiota, I'll pass it off to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Christine, so much. I appreciate you putting this webinar together and making it available to patients and families throughout the world uh, through your website and social media. It's such an important uh, topic. And Dan and Deborah, thanks for joining us this morning. You guys are the stars of the show. Oh so my gosh. We're going to be, uh, I'll sort of set a little bit of the stage of the importance of family history and why that's, that impacts a family member. And then we want to hear a little bit about your story, of course, um, your twin sisters. So the ultimate family history, because you have identical DNA. Um, and then you have other family members who also want to hear some of your story. But we'll get started. And this is one of the areas that I'm very, very passionate about, because um, although it's only the minority of cases, when there's a strong family history, meaning multiple members of one family have aneurysms, and often it's in the, the woman in the family, I've treated mothers, grandmothers, daughters, sisters, cousins, Although that family history is only present in a small minority of cases, when it is, it is so prevalent that it makes up 30 to 40% of the patients that we see. Because when you see it in families, I mean, it can really, really strongly uh, be present. And it's so important that we're aware of it so we can get screened and then either we follow closely or treat it. So here's just a, uh, some quick inf information before we get to our main stars, which are twin sisters, Diane and Deborah. These are some of the risk factors, just to educate some of the patients or family members that we may have watching this for just having an aneurysm. Um, so smoking and, and high blood pressure, each of them are a factor when you combine the two, they really are additive. Um, you can see having a family history aneurysm makes it almost three times more likely. Having multiple aneurysms also. And then we also um, already introduced the idea that female, something you can't change, is not a risk factor you can change, like smoking, you can stop smoking, but it's much more prevalent in women. And we just don't know why that is. Um, and then risk factors for actually having an aneurysm and the rupture. So not just having an aneurysm, but one that can bleed, of course, when you have an aneurysm rupture, that's a really life-threatening situation. So smoking is a big factor. You see it makes it twice as likely. Prior rupture from another aneurysm, and here's the family history of ruptured aneurysms, especially you have two or more first degree relatives. So if you had a sister and a mother, sister and aunt, a cousin and a, and a daughter or an aunt or a mother, then you can see that's the biggest contribution. So 17 times more likely that you yourself with an aneurysm could have a rupture and potentially end your life or really severely affect it if you have two or more family members that had a rupture. Aneurysm growth. You can see it's a huge, huge contributing factor, 12 times more likely. So I always tell patients, we may follow an aneurysm, but it stays small. I know one of you guys had an aneurysm that was small, but it changed over, over a few years and we treated it. An yeah. aneurysm can remain small, but if it changes while we're watching it closely, that is a concern and that will often trigger treatment because it could say it went from two millimeters to four millimeters is still a small aneurysm, but it's substantially grown from two to four millimeters. Mm -hmm. So we often will treat those before it has a chance to rupture and really hurt you. An irregular shape, of course, everybody focuses on the size, but you have these ugly shapes that are scary looking, longer ones that may have blebs on them. And the daughter sac is the ugliest of the shapes here shown below where you have almost like an ice cream cone appearance, an aneurysm on aneurysm. And that is one of the, the scariest um, shapes that, that may trigger treatment earlier. So that's just, I wanted to put some of the context of our discussion for the people watching. But now I wanna turn it over to Diane and Deborah, whoever wants to go first, maybe just tell us a little bit about how you found the aneurysms, who in your family has aneurysms, who's been screened, 
tell us a little bit of your story and then Christine and I will probably ask you some follow-up questions along the way. Deborah, I think you should go first since it started with you. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, I think um, in 2002, September, I had migraines a majority of my adult life. In my 20s, it started real bad. Um, my father passed away December 1st um, with a rupture. Um, I, I still think to this day that it was a ruptured aneurysm. He um, blew out and never came back from it. And eight months later, um, I finally got the doctors, please, you've got to just do something and check these this headache for me. And um, they found, I think it was a eight millimeter um, that had thrombosed. So they did a craniotomy then. Um, and because they didn't do the stuff, you know, at, at Pitt Memorial and Greenville then, no vascular surgery. So I had a craniotomy then and I waited for, you know, they followed me and then they found another one on my other side of my head um, and they did a cooling then. And then Diane had started check, getting her head checked and the first time she had a, um, a MRI, it was clear. Um, but then the next time she had an MRI, she found hers. I found two actually. I, yeah. I was a lot, like a lot of people who won't go and have it done. We nurses make the worst patients, but mm -hmm. I waited and waited and I had headaches. So I said, let me just go get it checked. That was probably three years after my first one. And they found two aneurysms. And I would have had those fixed in Greenville, but the doctor found my, the great Dr. Spiota, who was doing the study on the pulse rider because my basilar aneurysm, he was afraid to fix in Greenville, North Carolina. So that's how I ended up with Dr. Spiota. Um, he fixed that one in October and then I mean August and then October I had the second one fixed. But I didn't find mine until I decided to actually, yeah, you know, I need to, to repeat this MRI or CTA. And that's where I found my two aneurysms and have been followed with Dr. Spiota since. That's great. And Deborah, you mentioned when your father, who likely died of a rupture aneurysm, and you had the migraines, that it took you eight months to, to get that screening study to, to look at aneurysm. So you had some resistance in getting that? Yeah, well, like, you know, a lot of doctors, um, you know, they say, oh, it's just your migraine. But I knew that day that something was wrong. It just felt like I had been hit beside the head with a two by four. And I mean, it just came automatically on. And I told him, I said, please do something. Please check me. And even my primary care doctor, when he sent me to the neurosurgeon, he was kind of, um, you're just too young for this. I was 30 something. You're too young for aneurysm. And so when they found it, I remember sitting outside the neurosurgeon's office, calling my um, primary care doctor and say, Dr. Peters, let me tell you what I've got. And he said, I would have never thought you would have had this. I never would have thought you would have had this. Um, so I, I was shocked. I was very shocked and scared. <laughs> Um, but what bothers me is with sisters is that, you know, you tell your children to get checked. My son and daughters, they're getting checked. But, my you know, I have a little sister. Um, she's a nurse, too. And they found an aneurysm in her. And she's, you know, nurses do make some wonderful patients. But um, her doctor has told her that, oh, well, it's on a bony process. It won't it won't grow. Then she was having a severe headache again, where indeed doesn't have many headaches like that. And we knew something else was wrong. They did another MRI on her and they said, well, it's grown, but it won't get any bigger. You're 50 some years old. It'll be, you'll, de you'll be dead before it does anything. I don't understand why they're letting it go. Got it, got <laughs> it. And then Diane, when you were screened, well, first of all, Deborah, you know, great job in persevering and knowing your body and your concerns and, and getting that screening. Cause a lot of people, Christine, get turned around or turned away. Yeah. Don't persist. Now, Diane, when you had now your father who likely had a rupture and your sister with multiple aneurysms, when you went to get screened, what was that experience? Did you encounter any resistance or was that well, well received? Well, actually, I worked as the clinic site manager, so the doctor there ordered it, a CTA. I didn't have any problem that time, um, but I did have a problem getting my angiogram scheduled um, in Greenville. They put me off for, I want to say four months. I might've been longer than that. So I did have a problem with that. I don't know if that was insurance reason why or approval or what. I would have thought it would have been easy since, you know, my twin sister definitely had two aneurysms fixed, but it did take me a little long, little while longer to get an angiogram to fully diagnose, you know, that they were found. The CTA saw 
the aneurysms, but it took me about four to five months, I think, to get my aneurysm, I mean, my angiogram. Got it, got it. And as we were chatting about, you know, getting a CT angiogram, I just put it on the screen again for the viewers who are just learning about this, the, the common ways of screening, which is the CT angiogram, you guys already brought that up, it's a CAT scan, performed with injecting dye in one of the veins, usually in the arm, and they timed the, the dye to go back to the heart, and the heart pumps the dye everywhere to the body, including the brain. So as they take the pictures of the brain with the CAT scan, the arteries are lit up and outlined, silhouetted with the contrast. You can actually get a really nice detailed study of the arteries of the brain. And then the MR angiogram is a different modality, also commonly used as a screening. And these are great screening modalities as a first look. And like you mentioned, Diane, oftentimes the physician may do a diagnostic angiogram to follow, which is more invasive, which is why we don't start with the angiogram, but it gives some more detailed information. It can show aneurysms that are smaller, that may hide in the CAT scan and our MR angiogram. And it can show more readily if there's been a change in the size of the shape. But these first modalities, the CT angiogram, MR angiogram are great ways to get the screening. Now you guys both, did a great job and persevered, although you found a little bit of resistance in the system to getting screening. Not everybody patient, not every patient will do that. One of the frustrations I have, because this is one of my passions, is getting a family member screened. When I see mm -hmm. that a patient uh, that I can recall from just a year ago, young, had had a subarachnoid hemorrhage before I met her, had a, a treatment of that aneurysm, and came back with a recurrence of the same aneurysm, a second rupture, that's when I met her. And she ended up having seven aneurysms that I treated over the years. And her sister was so afraid to find out or even look, despite, you know, my patient, her sister telling her to get screened. She never did. And then uh, this is over five or six years when I was treating her. Um, and then ultimately last fall, she actually had a rupture and died. And for me, that was such a, you know, it really hit hard. And, and it, this is such a focus. So we try to give patients information. I spent a lot of time describing this. The frustration we have is, your family members aren't our patients, so I can't prescribe these studies for your sister, yeah. for your daughter. So all I can do is educate, but because they're not my patient, it is up to that individual patient to call their primary care. So we've actually provided pamphlets that says the exact wording. It's like a script. Yeah. And you can read verbatim. You know, my sister had aneurysm. My aunt had one. The neurosurgeon says I need to get screened with either CT or an MR angiogram. We try to make it easy. But it's still a bit of a challenge. So I want to get thoughts from Christine because you deal with this a lot, or Dan and Deborah. Yeah, no, what I was going to say before, I mean, the thing that's so frustrating about this disease and why sessions like this are so important to educate and raise awareness, because, you know, some of you really had to advocate for yourself, which is so critical and key, and people are often afraid to do it. But the things that I find amazing, which I think is still due to the lack of education around this disease. I think you said Diane initially had one scan that didn't show anything. So it is important to be rescanned over time because one of the mysteries of a brain aneurysm is when they form and why they form. And it's not the first time that I've heard of somebody say in their thirties to forties being scanned because of a family member and getting a clean scan and then five years later showing an aneurysm. So I think it's very important on this family history piece to be proactive. And then for your younger sister who has seen, you know, growth over time and maybe somebody not treating it or saying it's okay, I don't know who she's seeing or where she is, but it's certainly always important when someone has a concern. And again, particularly with the, the family connection, to be seeing somebody in a major center who sees these regularly and really understands the implication of letting something go and then a subsequent rupture happening. Um, yeah. So those are the things that really just stuck with me with what you said. And, and what makes it hard is because even there are practitioners that don't really see this, so they're not really thinking of it in their diagnosis. And again, that's why the awareness and education is hugely important. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely, Christine, you raised such a great point. As I always emphasize, the aneurysms, you're not born with them. So at the time you get screened, maybe you're 35, maybe you're 45, depending on the family history. If you don't have an aneurysm in that moment, it's great news. But it doesn't mean you're absolved from having one because they're an acquired condition. And it's wear and tear over time. The arteries are, um, there's blood flowing in the arteries. As your heart beats, it's a pulsation. If you feel your pulse, there's a pounding effect. 
and where there's a fork in the road or a bifurcation or a crossroads, as the blood goes left and right, it can hit the crotch of that uh, bifurcation. Over time, it can wear it down. So that's where the family history comes in. If you have a um, predisposition in your family, it's something that we haven't yet identified, hopefully with the research um, that we'll do in the future, we'll, we will identify it. There's something in the DNA where the artery is a little more fragile or more prone to forming these ballooning or outclouchings because of what the aneurysm is. But it's just a great point that these are, it's wear and tear, they're acquired over time. So it's such a great point. If we get somebody screen when they're 35, 45, and they're negative, no aneurysm, we still have to screen them for the rest of their lives. And Christine, thanks for bringing that up because that's so important. And another thing that I was going to say that a message that we try to get out there all the time is that brain aneurysms are very treatable. So the aneurysm yeah. itself isn't the issue, it's the rupture. And we want to prevent the rupture. So through, but people can treat something they don't know that they have. So again, knowing the signs and symptoms, being an advocate for yourself, and then being able to get the diagnosis because Dr. Spiota can tell you the different treatment methods, how they have changed over time. Um, I actually can say it here now because it's come a little public, our current board chair, who's a brain aneurysm survivor, should definitely misdiagnosed about five years ago um, from his primary care doctor, had a very bad rupture. At that time, they realized, you know, they saved him and he's doing very well but they also realized he had another brain aneurysm. But the location of it was such that they didn't wanna treat it. So they said, you know, we'll follow it and we'll see what happens. But they kind of left him at that point in time saying, if we're treating this aneurysm, it's gonna be because it's ruptured and we've tried to, tried to save your life. Well, he's now going to be having surgery November 1st to treat this aneurysm because now because of changes in the treatment methods, they feel mm -hmm. confident and that it's better for him to go in and do this. So, you know, it's one of those things. He has been living for five years wondering what's going to happen with this. And now just because of the, the what's advanced in the field, they feel comfortable. He has an educated decision. Three doctors looked at his films and agreed now, you know, yes, we can do this. So, you know, it's a scary thing, but it is amazing how the treatments have advanced and, you know, what science and research has done for this. So Dr. Spiota, maybe you can talk to that a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So as Christine mentioned, even just compared to three years ago and five years ago, certainly 10 years ago and beyond, the tools that we have available to treat aneurysms are just so rapidly evolving. Um, it's one of the most rapidly evolving areas in all neurosurgery, especially on the endovascular front, where we're going through the arteries, it's more minimally invasive. So if you look at what we were doing maybe 15 years ago, it was a split, even split 20 years ago, more surgeries than endovascular. Now, at one of our centers here at the Medical University of South Carolina, we're 90, 95% plus treating aneurysms through the endovascular route because patients cover much better. And there's definitely aneurysms that we can routinely address now and treat safely for patients. They go home the next day with the endovascular with no pain. That even 10 years ago, we never would have tried. And that's an amazing development just in 10 years. So we can definitely treat aneurysms more safely, more completely, and in a better way for patients. And Deborah, you mentioned you know first aneurysm you had a surgery for, and then the more recently it was endovascular. Maybe you can share your experience with the two different. And there's always you know surgery is always needed for some aneurysms, and surgery is a very good treatment modality. But more and more in the last ten to twenty years, we're treating endovascularly. Maybe you can um, say a few words about the different experience in the recovery with the surgery versus endovascular coiling. Well, craniotomy is nothing to play with. Um, um, it wasn't, I think my femur hurt worse than my craniotomy, really. Um, but um, it's just so much to deal with afterwards, the recovery. Um, with endovascular, you just, the next day you get to go home. It's not invasive. Um, it's just so much more care given with craniotomy where you just, it's, three, four months that you don't feel like yourself. Um, and then sometimes even to this day, you know, sometimes I don't feel like myself, you know, <laughs> but, um, but it's just so much easier. Um, so much easier on your, on your body and on your mental. I think it is. Um, cause you, you go through a lot. Diane used to say right after my brain, after my craniotomy, the neurosurgeon said, um, she'll be okay. Um, 
I was kind of acting odd afterwards and they said they scrambled my brain some and Diane says, well, please let her be okay because if not, she's going to a nursing home. <laughs> but um, as I'm a I was a totally different person compared to then and when I had my endovascular. It's I just so much more person. <laughs> I can speak to that as recovery because Deborah's her craniotomy, she did great. She extubated herself, but her recovery time, her mental recovery time was so it's amazing how this endovascular you can go and have a pretty invasive surgery on your brain and come home the next day and be fine you're a little weak but you're great but Deborah's craniotomy was it was tough on her it was tough on me um mentally she was totally not Deborah um so it took about four to five months for her to get back to pretty much of a norm and the endovascular surgery is such a greater and I praise God for Dr. Spiota and for this the ability for this to come about, but it's totally different and so much better. Yeah, the advances that I come up and, you know, if someone like me and our surgeon that specializes in brain aneurysms, this is, you know, like my number one passion is helping patients with aneurysms, always trying to advance the field. Dan, you mentioned you came to me from out of state because of a specific, you know, um, new device that I had a lot of experience with that worked great for you. So we're always trying to push it forward and like I mentioned, the last 10 years has been so much growth. And I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be even more rapid growth. Mm -hmm. So it's just always exciting. We can help, you know, more patients better. Mm -hmm. And Diane, I believe you had a smaller aneurysm. Um, or was it Deborah, a small aneurysm that had changed over time? Yes, me, Deborah. I had yeah. um, the basilar um, that had changed over time. They, and Greenville said that they were going to follow it. And then when they did my last... Um, angiogram to check it it had grown he said oh it's still small and that's when you know you were taking care of dying and I said can you please look at this and you said no it's changed in you know shape and size and so you you know treated it and that's again one of those important factors is given the strong family history of aneurysms plus ruptures that you both have you were had a small aneurysm was being watched but then it changed it got a little bit bigger and the shape of it actually from being smooth to pointier mm -hmm. We confirmed it with an angiogram, which is more detailed. Um, right. but some of those subtle changes can be missed or misinterpreted in one of these screening tests, like a CT or an MRI. And when that was confirmed, I just did not feel comfortable. That at that point, the risk essentially comes down to what's the risk of the aneurysm for you if left untreated to its own devices, may it rupture. Mm -hmm. and what's the treat? What's the risk of the treat of just treating it so it can't rupture? That's really what it comes down to. So Deborah, you and I looked at the pictures and had a discussion of the risk and benefits and decided to treat it for you because it had changed in the size and the configuration and the, and the shape. Right. Dr. Spioto, I was just going to ask you, what do you recommend? Because we always get asked all the time, but particularly was a clear familial case here for, you know, siblings, for children, for grandchildren, nieces, nephews. When do you recommend that somebody does get scanned? And then how often would you follow up knowing that an aneurysm can develop over time. Absolutely, it's a great question. I do, and I do tailor it a little bit to the to the particular family. In a family, there's aneurysm, a prevalence of aneurysms rupture at a younger age. Then I start screening much early. So if you have a an aunt and a mother had ruptures, sometimes you see them in their 30s. But I'm I'm screening their teenage children. Okay. Mm -hmm. If the ruptures are in the 50s and 60s, I'll probably start screening when they're mid 20s. Um. But to that great point about these develop over time, so you can't just have one look. I would start every five years if they're if they're negative. And then I space it out. So let's say I've been watching someone when they were 25, now 30, 35, 40, I may space it out at that point. If uh, if I watch them for a decade or two and they haven't had one form. If we start screening later, you know, in initial screens, you always want to get Love pictures you. closer together. And then if nothing is, is shown, then you can space it out. But I do start screening family members earlier if the history suggests an earlier age of rupture. Even as 15 or, or 17 I've done when they've been a family history of young age. So that's that's a very important part also. Um, and then Diane, Deborah, I wanted to, of course, you guys have a sister, non-twin sister. Yeah. Um, how is that discussion with your non-twin sister about getting screened? She was, I believe, the last one to get screened. Um, and how did who approached her? What did, what did that discussion look like? 
he actually started with headaches as well and then went to get um they decided with Deborah's history and my history to do the CTA um and we they found the aneurysm but it's small um to be honest with you D is the type her name's D and she's the type that well it's okay I'm just gonna leave it alone I'm fine nothing's happened and we have as lately as last week we say you need to call Dr. Spiota I mean she's very headstrong about I'm just gonna die with it um so it's very hard to try to to talk to a family member especially your baby sister who won't go and do something else I mean we have talked to her and talked to her she said it, it's okay and we said well it's the same doctor that said it wasn't going to grow but it's growing right. we need to do something D but she's headstrong about it not wanting to go do anything so it can be very difficult approaching a family member or especially your baby sister who doesn't want to do anything after seeing both Deborah's history and my history she still is adamant it's okay it's okay it's just okay now I have to say my son was the day you told him in Charleston that, son, you need to be che um, checked. He's had it every five years. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord, it's been normal. But because of your instructions, he went and had one. And five years later, he had a second one. So some family members can be very hard to um, mm -hmm. get to, to, to make them understand. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose it's, because um, that's what I suspect is, when I instruct my patients to tell their families, but oftentimes we don't see that they're getting their screening. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's uh, being in fear, Christine. I think people are just afraid, right? Yeah, no, that's just what I was going to say. I mean, I've heard this time and time again, too. And it is, it, I've heard it too, even um, a local family here and the mother had passed another sister. They were part of um, a local road race here. One sister was running this road race and the other sister who was a nurse won't get screened. And, <laughs> just like so you can't figure it out so I think it is just some in, innate fear again mm -hmm. which is why any talk you know discussion around this the awareness and education and again I, I mean I get it it's a scary thing to have brain surgery in any form whether it's you know the clipping or the coiling um, but when we see outcomes and I mean speaking to you ladies and seeing how well you're doing I mean, it just, you would think your sister sees that, that you have your life. I mean, we see so many people that end up, you know, with a rupture either through misdiagnosis or maybe not getting that scan and the, the disabilities that they have. And that goes on for a lifetime. You know, those mm -hmm. things don't go away. And that so impacts a family. And in fact, the community they, they live in, you know, people aren't able to go back to work. And again, I go back to the, how the developments in the treatments that are there. And like you've had the, the endovascular and um, the clipping going through the head and having you know, a piece of your skull removed to treat it, but things have refined in the mm -hmm. outcome. Again, what we wanna do, we wanna treat people or advocate obviously for people to be treated prior to rupture because the mm -hmm. treatment methods are just so amazing. And there are so many, skilled doctors like Dr. Spiotr, if they're at a ma major medical center, you know, that really know what they're doing that can take care of people. So when I hear this, it's like, oh, you know, it's upsetting and you would love to have your sister follow through. But at the same time there, I've heard it time and time again, in every family, there always seems to be that one. And it is just some fear. And I guess, again, it's just, you know, Open prayer over time, if it's your family member, that you can get them somehow to turn that corner and maybe just listen to more stories of survival and then other stories of loss and, and see, yeah. you know, where do you want to fit in, not just for you, but for your loved ones around you who really care for you and want you to be well. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's such an important message. Um, and I did want to, we talked about the, the rapid developments. I did want to show you because I want to end this in a positive note, a rapid development. So, of course, we get these CT angiograms, MR angiograms. But like I mentioned, things can be missed. And even if, you know, the, there's, there's limitations and some areas are more prone to having limitations or challenges, like where the bone is and where the artery curves. But ultimately, it's a human being and a human eye that has to look at it. So things can be missed. So when I have anybody of uh, my patients and their family members are being screened, even if they're not in my network, they're in California or Alaska, I always offer they can send me their CDs and I can take a look at it too, because maybe I see something. You never, you know, the more eyes, the better. 
So one of the areas that we're partnering with is actually having artificial intelligence, actually software-based, looking for aneurysms. And Christine, you know, the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, their big campaign, it's a great, it's scan to save. Because yeah. really it's, that's the concept. You scan and you can potentially save a life. That's what we're, that's how we're approaching it. Yeah. If you don't have an aneurysm and a rupture, you know, a quarter of the patients are dead um, on the spot. Half of them will ultimately die. And then of those surviving, a third will never be the same. Yeah. So it's, it's one of the most devastating, I mean, heart attack, stroke, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, they're all vying for the top. You can make an argument that one of them is, is, is the worst of all of them. Yeah. So one of the things we're working on in the areas we're developing is actually having um, artific artificial intelligence help us screen. So this is actually a CT angiogram from one of you, I won't say which, and these <laughs> that are being picked up by the software. So it would help a radiologist or a neurosurgeon is looking at them. And we can do this off a of CT angiogram, an MR angiogram here, looking from the backside, looking from the side. Actually, soon this will be available on my phone. So if you call me from out of state, I can, you can send me your images. I can look at them. I can have the software help me. And we can rotate it, look at it, study it, talk about a game plan. We can mag in, get measurements. And we can really closely look over time has there been a change in that aneurysm? Because that would be, like we mentioned already, you know, a factor for potentially deciding to treat or not. So all these are coming down. So I just want to give more and more hope. We have more and more tools, like Christine mentioned, to treat aneurysm safely so that it's better just to treat it so it can't rupture on you because a rupture is worse for you. And that continues to improve and it has rapidly. I think it's going to continue even more rapidly. And we have things, you know, research, if you look at the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, the research they're supporting with genetics and, and interpreting inflammation in the dome, there's every aspect, molecular, biochemical, pharmacologic, interventional, all these areas were expanding and growing at a really rapid rate. So I just wanna leave with a very positive note, more and more hope for patients to get their aneurysms uh, identified and treated. But yeah, I did wanna give Diane and Deborah the last, uh, if you have any, <laughs> Words of wisdom for anybody who might be watching who isn't getting scanned or who's afraid, who has a family member. I'm actually going to speak for us, Diane. Um, I have to speak to the advancement because um, in my area where you took care of me, the pulse rider wasn't available in the United States at the time. And you actually got it here for me and to start that. So there is an advancement in the United States because of you, um, because of this study. I have to speak to the fear. Um, I was fearful. Um, I had my first one, it was fine, but when they gave me the news that I had actually two of them, I said, my first thought was, I'm not as strong as Deborah. I can't do this. And because of the advancements, um, because of the endovascular surgery, I was able to have it and was able to return to work, return to my life, where if I had had some other outcome, I couldn't have been. So testing and retesting is absolutely the necessary thing because I was one of the ones who was tested and said, I had nothing, so I'm fine. So I said, you know, four years later, I said, I've got to get something's not right. And that's where I find them. So retesting, testing is the way to go. Um, the surgery is, is easy. It's so easy to take care of something that can be treated. Preventative medicine is the very best. And I want to thank you, Dr. Spiota. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. And Dan and Deborah, really, really appreciate, like I said, you guys are the star of this webinar. <laughs> and the information you guys are providing for patients and families who will ultimately watch this, because the Brain Injuries Foundation has a very, very large reach. There'll be lots of people looking at this. What you guys have shared with us today is going to save lives, I have no doubt. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I know, absolutely. I want to say thank you so much because again, the fear is a big component and that's something else that we say is we want to raise awareness to end the fear. And that's, yeah. you know, ultimately what this will help do because people will listen to your stories. And again, thank you to Dr. Spiota because he isn't a, a doctor who just treats and sends people home. He cares, he follows up and his passion for this disease goes into collaborating with um, technologies like this to, with AI that is going to make a difference to follow aneurysms for patients to better understand. And like he said, the, the naked eye can't see everything. So, you know, I want to say thank you to Dr. Spiota because he does care so much. He does give back. 
um, and he engages folks like you to to share, to educate, and hopefully alle alleviate fears for others. So I thank you so much for taking your time and being willing to share your story because I know it can, can be hard to go back and talk about everything that you went through. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Have a good rest of your weeks. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Take care.